Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, that's wonderful. It feels like spring today, and I am delighted to welcome you to the Wolverine Caucus. We like to think that the Wolverine Caucus is helping us to improve the world one forum at a time. And so today, we're covering a very important topic, and we have some of the most illustrious and knowledgeable presenters here from the University of Michigan National Poll on Healthy Aging and the Institute for Health Policy Studies um, Initiatives. And to introduce them, we are so honored to have the Honorable John Bison. Senator Bison represents the 19th Senate District, the great city of Battle Creek, Michigan, and he is a medical doctor. And so one of the things that's wonderful about that is the ability that he will have to share with you, not only in his context as vice chair of the Senate Health Policy and Human Services Committee, but also his wisdom about medical care in Michigan. So it's a wonderful day to be here to share with you. And without further ado, would you please join me in welcoming Senator John Bison. Good morning. It is great to be with you today. Thank you for the opportunity to come and join you. And I look forward to uh, working with each of you and challenging each of you to make us a better state, a better community. Uh, welcome to the Poll on Aging. And uh, I'm here to introduce my colleague, Dr. John Ianian. Uh, he is a professor of internal medicine at the U of M Medical School, uh, health management and policy at the School of Public Health, and public policy at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. So and it sounds like you have policy written all over your name, sir. Uh, the inaugural director of the Institute of Health Policy and Innovation, where his research has focused on the effects of race, ethnicity, gender, and insurance coverage on access to uh, care and clinical outcomes, and impact of physician specialty and organizational characteristics, a whole mouthful that I'm having trouble just getting through here, uh, the quality of care for cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and major health conditions. Uh, he has been part of the Institute of Health, the very uh, Institute of Medicine, the American Society for Clinical Investigation, the Association of American Physicians, and is also a fellow of the American College of Physicians and recipient of several awards to include the John, uh, John M. Eisenhower, Eisenberg Award for Career Achievement in Research, from the, Center of the, from the Society of General Internal Medicine as well as being an elected member to the uh, National Academy of Medicine. Um, too many great universities that you come from, sir. Duke, Harvard, uh, both medical school and the Kennedy School of Government, uh, residency at uh, Boston's Brigham and Women's Hospital, and a fellowship in internal medicine and health services research at Harvard. We are pleased to have you here. Before I hand over the microphone, I would like to challenge everyone in the room on my perspective of healthcare. We had a governor who felt that if something was important, that he wanted to measure it. So he had this thing called the dashboard that he had put up for all of us to look at. And he measured some crazy things on it, like obesity and hypertension and diabetes and, and smoking. And he said that if we are interested in the health of our population, perhaps these are the things we need to look at. When I look back over that, we had some improvement in neonatal mortality over the last eight years. Our childhood obesity went up just a little bit. And uh, most of the other criteria has been relatively flat in spite of us as a state spending over $20 billion dollars in healthcare spending over that period of time. And uh, as a payer, I, I scratch my head and wonder, are we looking at the right stuff when we look to population health? 
and we have spent quite so much money, and you know we can show a significant improvement in doctor visits, as you can see from any of the HEDIS measures, but is that truly where we need to get to in order to have a healthy population, and how important is it that we have a healthy population? And so I would challenge you today and in the future to look to see not only for measures of how many times one goes to the doctor, but also is it truly moving the scale on getting us healthier, getting us more active, getting us more fit, because I think there are a great many things that we need to do to get us there. So Dr. Ianian is uh, certainly a accomplished gentleman who has dedicated his career not only to health policy, but uh, assessing its impact. Please join me in welcoming him, and I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Baizan. Uh, I'm, as the Senator noted, I'm John Ianian, the Director of the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation at the University of Michigan, also known as IHPI. Uh, IHPI is the nation's largest university-based organization of health services researchers working across diverse disciplines uh, to solve complex and timely health challenges. Microphone. Okay. Oh, I understand. We've got two mics, one for the camera and, and one for the rest of you. Uh, so let me start over. As the Senator noted, I'm John Ianian, the Director of the University of Michigan Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation, also known as IHPI. Uh, IHPI is the nation's largest university-based organization of health services researchers, working together across diverse disciplines to solve complex and timely health challenges. IHPI unites over 600 faculty members from 14 schools and colleges at the University of Michigan, strategically aligning broad expertise to respond to vital questions within healthcare policy and practice. Many of our members have expertise in aging policy, the topic of our session today, and the healthcare needs of older adults in our state and nation. We're excited that today's Wolverine Caucus will highlight one of IHPI's newest strategic initiatives, the National Poll on Healthy Aging. Our National Poll on Healthy Aging is a nationally representative household survey launched in 2017 in partnership with AARP. The poll taps directly into the insights, experiences, and perspectives of older adults ages 50 to 80 related to their health, health care, and health-related decision-making to better inform the public, health care providers, and policymakers on issues related to policy and practice in aging. In less than two years, the National Poll on Healthy Aging has released 16 reports on a variety of issues related to healthy aging. At today's event, two of the, of the leaders of the National Poll on Healthy Aging, Dr. Erica Solway and Dr. Jeff Culgren, will share important insights about what we've learned from older adults participating in the poll. Dr. Solway is an Associate Director of the National Poll on Healthy Aging. She also manages the University of Michigan's Evaluation of the Healthy Michigan Plan and other Medicaid-related projects. Before returning to Michigan, she served as a Policy Advisor on Health and Aging in the U.S. Senate. She received her dual master's degrees in social work and public health with a specialist in aging certificate from the University of Michigan. She received her PhD degree in sociology from the University of California, San Francisco. Our second speaker, Dr. Jeff Culgren, is a research scientist in the Center for Clinical Management Research at the VA Ann Arbor Healthcare System and an assistant professor of internal medicine at the University of Michigan Medical School and the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation. Like Dr. Solway, he's also an associate director of the National Poll on Healthy Aging. He received his undergraduate and medical degrees from Michigan State University and his Master of Public Health degree from the University of Michigan. He completed residency training in internal medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, and he was a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation clinical scholar at the University of Pennsylvania. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Solway and Dr. Culgren as they highlight key findings from recent reports of the National Poll on Healthy Aging on prescription drugs, dental care, opioids, health insurance, and loneliness. Dr. Solway.
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. It's truly my pleasure uh, to be here to welcome you and to talk to you a little bit about our project, the University of Michigan National Poll on Healthy Aging. Um, so I wanted to first uh, introduce um, the members of our team. Uh, we have an exceptional group of people that I get to work with at the University of Michigan Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation on this new initiative. Our director of the poll is Preeti Milani. Um, she's a professor of internal medicine with a focus on infectious diseases at the University of Michigan Medical School. Um, I also have the pleasure of working with Dr. Jeff Colgren. As Dr. Ayanin introduced, uh, Jeff and I both serve as uh, so co-associate directors of the National Pool on Healthy Aging. We also work with a terrific analyst and project manager who, um, uh, who makes sure that our work continues. We, um, we, as Dr. Ayanin mentioned, we release reports on pretty much a monthly or bi-monthly basis, meaning that we're always uh, focusing on the next thing. Um, we also partner with IHPI members with expertise on, on specific topics so that we can uh, kind of further our work in, in, in more deeply in areas of interest uh, related to healthy aging. So why the National Poll on Healthy Aging? Some of you may be familiar with the CS, CS Mott Children's Hospital National Poll on Children's Health. That's a poll that's been uh, administered through, uh, through the University of Michigan for quite some time with great success. That poll focuses on gathering the perspectives of parents as it relates to children's health issues. And we were thinking at IHPI, members of our leadership, we were thinking that we could offer something similar by gathering the insights and experiences of older adults as it relates to healthy aging. So using that, that poll as a model, we developed the National Poll on Healthy Aging. And why is this important? Well, many of us know um, uh, people are living longer, Americans are living three decades longer now than they did a century ago. And what that means is that we're seeing a demographic shift. So although we're seeing growth in, um, in, in all age groups, we're seeing a dramatic growth in the population over 50. And that's especially true here in Michigan. Uh, currently, there are over 2.4 million people in Michigan who are 60 years of age or older. And by some metrics, Michigan is aging faster than the rest of the nation. Um, in some cases, um, uh, we are leading the way. So I wanted to take a few minutes to tell you a little bit about the goals of the um, National Poll on Healthy Aging, and then Jeff's going to help us delve a little bit deeper into some of our recent findings. So our first goal of the poll is to develop, implement, and sustain a recurring nationally representative household survey of US adults age 50 to 80. Um, and we do that through methods that Jeff's going to describe. And, and part of our work then is to take our findings and release them in the form of reports and infographics that help to inform the public and policymakers about the experiences and perspectives of older adults. So Jeff is going to give us a little bit more about some of our recent findings. Okay, well, thank you for that, Erica. Um, so as Erica said, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we do the National Poll on Healthy Aging. She talked a bit about the motivation for it. I'm going to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of how we do it and highlight some of the more policy-relevant reports that we've released over the last couple of years uh, to illustrate some examples of the kind of work that we do and the kind of questions we ask as part of the poll. So we conduct the National Poll on Health Healthy Aging through a series of surveys that are conducted using Ipsos Knowledge Panel. Uh, this is formerly known as GFK Knowledge Panel, which was formerly known as Knowledge Networks. So you may have heard of some of those things over the years. Uh, currently, it's Ipsos Knowledge Panel. And it constitutes the largest online national probability-based panel in the United States. We field our surveys two to three times per year to approximately 2,000 individuals who are between ages 50 and 80. And then we take the responses that we get to those surveys and then we weight them to make them nationally representative of adults age 50 to 80 across the United States. The completion rates for our surveys tend to be above 70% uh, among the individuals from Ipsos Knowledge Panel who are invited to participate in a given survey. 
Um, all of the surveys are conducted online. Now you may ask yourself, well this is a population age 50 to 80, these are online surveys, how in the world can this be nationally representative? Um, Ipsos Knowledge Panel has decades of experience in, uh, in developing the methods that allow us to generate nationally representative estimates from this poll and other surveys using their panel. And the way that they do it is twofold. Number one, if you don't have an, a device that can be connect, connected to the internet, in order to do an online survey, you are provided one, either a tablet or a computer. Secondly, if you lack internet access, you're given that too. In that way, internet access to the technology and access to the internet do not stand as barriers uh, to people being able to, to participate in our surveys. Okay, so over the next several slides, I'm gonna go through five examples of some of our reports over the last two years uh, that I think are particularly policy relevant, and, and Erica will highlight some of the ones a little bit later uh, that may be of interest to you that are not featured here as among the five of the 16 that we've produced thus far. So the first one, this is actually the first report generated from the National Poll on Healthy Aging, and this addressed an, an issue that continues to recur in the news, and for those of us that care for patients, uh, we hear from our patients all the time, and that's prescription drug costs. So this was a report that focused on the roles of doctors and pharmacists in helping patients be able to afford the prescription drugs they need. This is, of course, uh, we're all aware this is a really important healthcare delivery and public health issue for older adults. Uh, and uh, as evidence of that, we found as part of that poll that um, two thirds of older adults, or 63%, report taking two or three more prescription drugs. And so this is an issue that is very, very common for older Americans. So the, one of the first questions that we asked as part of that poll is, to what extent people feel financial burdens from the prescription drugs that they take? And we found, uh, as, as reported uh, from this particular module, that 27% of adults age 50 to 80 reported the cost of their prescription drugs was a burden for them. So over one in four adults age 50 to 80. Um, so that then kind of begs the question, well, what could we do about that problem? One thing we were curious about is how often patients who face financial burdens were talking to their doctors about their prescription drug costs. And we found that 49% of older adults who said their drug costs were a financial burden for them had not talked to their doctor about their costs. So that's the glass is half empty part of it. The glass is half full part of it is, well, what happens to the people who do talk to their doctors about their prescription drug costs? And what we found there is that among those who had talked with their doctors about their financial burdens, from their prescription drugs, that two-thirds of them said that their doctor had recommended to them a less expensive drug. Now, there's of course not only healthcare providers or physicians who can help with that too, there are other members of the healthcare team that can help solve some of those problems for patients. And in fact, 37% of people who face financial burdens from their prescription drugs and had talked to their doctor about it said that a pharmacist had, helped, had recommended to them a less expensive drug. So I think that illustrates some important opportunities perhaps for older adults to work with their doctors and to work with pharmacists to find uh, ways to better afford the prescriptions, the drugs they need for their chronic conditions and for their other health needs. So the second report that I'll talk about now uh, focused on dental care at midlife, specifically around people's unmet needs and their uncertainty about the future in being able to access uh, uh, dental care. Now, as often happens in our reports, we mentioned that the, the poll in general focuses on adults age 50 to 80. This report in particular focused on adults 50 to 64. The reason why we did that is there have been a number of surveys looking at use of dental care and access to dental insurance among the Medicare eligible population. We were particularly interested in people who have not yet reached Medicare eligibility age, and we wanted to see what their use of dental care was like and their access to dental insurance. So one of our main findings from that particular part of the poll uh, showed how adults age 50 to 64 use dental care, and we found wide variation in the way that older adults use dental care. So we found that 60% of people tend to be more what we categorize as being prevention focused. They tend to get regular cleanings in addition to acute needs for dental care. Uh, many fewer people received kind of inconsistent prevention, 17% of people getting only occasional cleanings. But more people used dental care in a more problem-oriented way. So in other words, they were not getting preventive dental care, uh, but instead were waiting until dental problems had reached kind of a critical need and then would only access dental care at that point. Now that use of dental care looked different among individuals who uh, reported that they were embarrassed about the condition of their teeth. So we found in our poll that 
Uh, 34% of adults age 50 to 64 reported being embarrassed about their teeth. Why did we ask about that? Well, there's a few reasons why we asked about that. Number one, that may represent a poor state of one's dentition, which can lead to not only more dental problems, but also other related health problems. Um, also, that has very important social implications, especially for employment opportunities, as well as connecting to other uh, individuals in the community. Um, and so that's why we asked about to what extent people felt like they were embarrassed about the condition of their teeth. And what we found among those individuals, uh, the vast majority of them, 63%, said they had only used dental care for a problem and had not received routine preventive care. Um, so I think that highlights a potentially vulnerable population of older adults who may, not, who may have insufficient access to dental care um, and for whom there may be policy solutions that would help them be able to get more preventive dental care to hopefully prevent some of those later stage problems. Stepping back from how people actually use dental care, we wanted to ask people to look forward a little bit and have them think about how they think they might be able to access dental care uh, when they do hit age 65. And what we found there is that many adults age 50 to 64, 51% in fact, said they didn't know how they will get dental insurance when they turn 65. Now you may say to yourself, well, many of those individuals have 10 years or so to figure that out. And so maybe when they get close to that age, maybe they'll find some of those opportunities. Of course, many individuals who responded to this survey, though, were about to reach that age. They were maybe more 60 to 64. Um, and I think that that uh, highlighted, for, highlighted for us, again, a, a critical opportunity to think of how we might improve access to not only dental insurance but dental care for individuals as they're approaching Medicare eligibility age. Okay, so the next report that I'm going to talk about um, is one that uh, the, on a public health topic, uh, opioid prescriptions, that I think speaks for itself, of course. Um, however, it's, uh, opioid prescriptions are of a special concern to older adults uh, because they're more likely to undergo procedures that can lead to acute pain, whether that be a spine surgery, whether that be a joint replacement. Um, and so this particular module, uh, which was released last summer, uh, our report here focused on older adults' experiences with opioid prescriptions. And uh, one of the first things that we asked about as part of that particular survey was how many adults age 50 to 80 had received an opioid prescription in the last two years. And we found that 29% of them had received an opioid prescription. Now, there were a couple things that we were interested in, uh, uh, in particular, among those individuals. We wanted to know, number one, what did they talk with their doctors about when they were getting that prescription? Okay. Uh, far and away, the most common thing that people talked with their doctors about is how often they should take the medication. 90% of people had talked about that. Much less common was people talking about potential side effects that they could anticipate or watch for when they were taking that opioid medication. Uh, nearly as many people, 59%, uh, had talked with their doctor about when they should reduce the amount that they take. Many fewer people had talked about the risk of addiction, about the risk of overdose, or what to do with pills that they had left over when they didn't need them anymore. That naturally, of course, begs the question that may be in many of your minds, well, what did people actually say they did with their medicines when they didn't need them anymore? And here's what we found there. So um, this is among, again, individuals age 50 to 80 who said they had received an opioid prescription in the last two years. 86% of them said they had saved them for later use or they had kept them at home. Now, I think we've all seen reports in the media about what can happen when people have prescription drugs for, for opioids and uh, other controlled substances uh, that are in a medicine cabinet at home. And so uh, that's a really, really common response to not needing opioid prescriptions anymore is putting it on the shelf or putting it in the medicine cabinet. Um, very few people, only 13%, had returned them to an approved location. For example, returning them back to a healthcare provider's office or to a pharmacy returning them to law enforcement officials or at a community take-back event that we're increasingly seeing around our state. Um, and 9% of people said that they had thrown it in the garbage or flushed it down the toilet. Now that, of course, can have other public health consequences, and so we worry about that a lot, too. Um, some of you may be wondering here, if you're trying to add up the numbers, well, that adds up to more than 100%. In these questions, we did ask people, what did you do with them? And they could select more than one option. But I think these are really important uh, findings, uh, not only to improve the health care delivery of uh, older adults who may need opioid prescriptions, especially in the context of a procedure that can lead to acute pain, but also that we more routinely counsel those patients about what, uh, how to reduce the harms from those medications and also how to reduce some of the public health consequences that can happen when people have 
leftover opioid prescriptions in their homes. I'll close in this particular section with two of our more recent reports. Um, and so this is the fourth of the fifth that I'll talk, uh, the fourth out of the five that I'll talk about. And this one focused on health insurance decision making near retirement. Now this too uh, is an issue that we see more and more in the news, especially at the federal level as you see more proposals, for example, for Medicare for All or other ways that people might be able to uh, access affordable health insurance when they have not yet quite reached Medicare eligibility age. What we found in this particular part of the poll is that adults, and this also, like the dental report, focused on adults age 50 to 64. And what we found here is that many individuals in that age group uh, were making employment decisions specifically so they could maintain their access to employer-sponsored health insurance. We found, for example, that 14% of people said they had kept a job specifically so they could maintain health insurance through an employer. And another 11% said that they had delayed or considered delaying retirement in order to keep their health insurance through an employer. So that deals with employment. We wanted to step back from that and again, much like we did in the dental report, ask people to look forward a little bit um, and to get their perceptions of their access to affordable health insurance as they age and get closer to Medicare eligibility. 27% um, of individuals age 50 to 64 said that they are not confident that they could afford their health insurance over the next year. That's more than one in four adults age 50 to 64 are saying they're not sure over the next year that they could afford their health coverage. Nearly half of people, 45%, said they were not confident that they could afford health insurance when they retire. So I think this is an issue that we will continue to see more and more of the news, again, especially as you see more federal proposals for what to do about this problem. Um, but I think our uh, findings around this particular report highlight the need to make health insurance more affordable for adults as they reach Medicare eligibility age. And again, I think we'll continue to see more public discourse about this issue. So the last report that I'll talk about before I turn it back to Erica uh, was a report that we just released in the last couple weeks, and this one focused on loneliness and health. Now, uh, loneliness and health, so this is a little bit of a to different topic than we had uh, gone through in the last several reports. I think it illustrates that in the poll, we think broadly about health for older adults. We think not only about healthcare delivery and about health policy, we also think about public health, and we also think about mental health and about general well-being uh, for this population. Uh, the um, uh, former Surgeon General just in the last two years had uh, described loneliness as being a public health ep epidemic. Um, so we were particularly interested in how common loneliness is in this population and what its associations were with adverse uh, health outcomes or adverse health states. And what we found in this report is that among adults age 50 to 80, 34 percent of them reported feeling a lack of companionship. Another 27% of them said that they felt isolated from others. Um, and so that to us illustrated that this is, these are very, very common. Uh, among, this is, uh, loneliness is very, very common among older adults. Um, and uh, I don't have it on the slide here, but I will say also we found that individuals who were socially isolated or felt a lack of companionship, uh, they had lower levels of physical health, lower levels of mental health and we're less likely to engage in healthy behaviors. So there's been this work and others that has also highlighted some of the health consequences of loneliness. Um, and again, I think this is yet another area where there may be some opportunities for state and federal policy solutions to help older adults feel more connected to others, more a part of their communities, and hopefully thus improve their health and their well-being. So I went through that very, very quickly. There will be an opportunity to talk to, for questions and answers a little bit later. Um, but hopefully that gives you a sense of how exactly we conduct the poll, some of the topics we focused on, what some of our main findings have been that are most relevant to health policy for older adults. Um, I'll now turn it back to Erica, who will be talking about how we disseminate our results through multiple channels in order to reach a variety of audiences and stakeholders. So as Jeff noted, I'd like to talk a little bit more about our efforts to disseminate our results because one of our main goals 
uh, as, he, as he said, is that we really want to make sure that people are aware of what the perspectives and experiences of older adults are. And we think of our audience as uh, m multiple audiences um, for our message, um, including older adults and their families, healthcare professionals, and policymakers. And as you can imagine, that means reaching um, those audiences through a variety of means. Um, so and just to take a step back, so um, Jeff uh, walked us through some of our uh, five of our reports, many of which we consider to be some of our more policy relevant reports. But as Dr. Ianian mentioned, we actually have released 16 reports in the last uh, two years, some of which had um, more of a, a, a consumer or older adult focus, others with more of a provider focus. So to give you a few more examples of some of the work we've released uh, through the National Poll on Healthy Aging, I wanted to just describe a few of the other topics we've addressed as well. So, for example, some of the ones that we consider to be more focused on older adults and their families and some of the key issues for them included reports related to sleep, uh, dementia caregiving, sexual health, vision, and, and urinary incontinence. So all of those topics, although they are intended to reach the variety of audiences that we hope to reach the poll. We're a little bit more focused on older adults and their families, uh, questions or uh, communication strategies for uh, reaching out to providers and others related to those issues. Um, we also had some reports that were more focused on um, information that might be helpful to providers, including a report related to drug interactions, uh, one about perceptions of the um, uh, flu vaccine in, in nursing home settings, whether they should be mandatory or recommended, um, and also a report related to older adults' perspectives on the on overuse of, of medical care, which was led by uh, Dr. Colgren. Um, and finally, we've, we've also addressed other policy-relevant topics, including perspectives on medical marijuana and also the use of patient portals. So again, those topics do cross the various audiences we intend to reach, but also have a little bit more of a focus on a particular area um, um, that, that might reach one of those audiences a little bit more, more closely than others. So one of our main strategies to get our message out there is through, uh, through communication with the media. We have a terrific uh, um, Kara Gavin here um, with our communications team who helps us to develop press releases that um, state our findings in slightly different ways than they, we do in our reports. And uh, we have been able to uh, have our results highlighted in a number of news outlets, um, many of which are, are listed here. Um, sometimes it involves uh, uh, radio or, or online media. Um, we, we do interviews, um, we offer the opportunity to connect with other IHPI members who may be you know, experts in these particular topics so we can delve a little bit more deeply into them. Um, so this has been a great avenue for getting the word out about the findings from the poll. In addition, um, we have partnered with AARP, they're a, um, the major sponsor of this poll, and one of the really neat things that comes from that partnership is the ability to highlight these results in the AARP bulletin. Um, so many of you probably receive the AARP bulletin, it, it, it's delivered to millions of households each month, um, and this is an example of the way that the AARP bulletin uh, editors took some of the results from the poll and kind of used them to tell a, a story, similar to how we did in the report, but also a little bit different. So this is um, a bulletin infographic from that first report that Jeff mentioned, which was on, um, on drug costs and, and the role of doctors and, and pharmacists. And as you can see here, um, as described in the bulletin, they told a story from older adults clearly are taking a lot of medication. Um, and then go on to say that, those, that the cost of those medications can be a struggle, um, but yet few patients are bringing up those drug costs with their doctors, and it says, and then they're leaving many of the doctors in the dark, um, which means that only a few of the doctors are offering a cheaper alternative, um, and um, the same goes for pharmacists. So, as, as Jeff mentioned, our message was, of course, you know, if people are having these conversations with their doctors and pharmacists, there's an opportunity potentially to address those burdensome drug costs. Um, and then this is um, ARP's version of telling a very similar story to a much broader audience. 
Um, we also, one of our goals is also to reach an academic audience, um, both clinicians and researchers who may be interested in these specific topics. So we are just starting to produce manuscripts, academic products related to this work. This was our first paper published, um, this was in the American Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry. This used data from the module on sleep and um, this focused on prescription and non-prescription sleep product use among older adults in the United States. And interestingly enough, even this paper has been picked up by news outlets. So for example, Time Magazine um, uh, was aware of this uh, and, and, and cited this, in, this uh, research in an article that they did. So again, we're kind of, it's helping to perpetuate the, um, the spread of information about older adults' perspectives on these important topics. Another way that we're getting our results out there is through um, the Health Affairs blog. Many of you are probably familiar with this. This is um, uh, part of the, the journal Health Affairs. Um, it reaches both an academic audience and also a, po a policy audience. So this is a, um, a Health Affairs blog post that, uh, that Jeff and our director Preeti Milani worked on related to uh, curbing overuse of low-value healthcare services by engaging older patients. So using the results of our module related to the overuse, perspectives on the overuse of medical care to help um, think about how uh, providers can have conversations with patients and maybe to make providers more aware that, um, that older adults don't necessarily see more healthcare as better. Um, sometimes there's a perspective that that's the case and I think our results suggest, suggest it otherwise. So we've done a few blog posts through the Health Affairs blog and anticipate doing several more. Uh, one of the other neat things is that we've been able to disseminate our results through um, the introduction of, of um, federal policy. So uh, just last month, Senators, uh, both of our Michigan Senators, Senator Stabenow and Senator Peters, uh, introduced the Medicare at 50 Act. And um, we were really surprised and delighted to see that in the press release um, from Senator Stabenow's office, she included results from our National Poll and Healthy Aging report on health insurance decision making. So Jeff highlighted um, some of the results from that uh, report, but uh, in the press release, uh, they included the stat the statistic that today, 27% of adults approaching retirement are not confident that they can afford health insurance over the next year, and more than a quarter have issues navigating health insurance options, coverage decisions, and out-of-pocket costs. Many did not get the care they needed because of how much it would cost or kept or delayed retirement to keep their employer-sponsored health insurance. So you can see how we had some of those uh, data points in infographics in our report and then how policymakers have used those to inform um, the development of legislation to address these important topics. So I wanted to take a minute to talk a little bit about some of our upcoming reports. As we've mentioned, we've had 16 reports released to date. Um, we are currently releasing about eight reports per year. Our next report will be coming out in a couple weeks and will focus on pets and health. Um, so a really fun and interesting topic. We often um, develop uh, videos as well to disseminate our results and we'll be, we'll be uh, releasing a video along with that report in early April. Um, our May topic will be on brain health. And then uh, in July, August, uh, in this summer, we'll be focusing on grandparenting and the role of grandparenting in health. I also want to take a minute to talk a little bit more about uh, IHPI's role in um, in uh, supporting aging-related research. Um, I hope many of you are familiar with IHPI. If you're, if you're not, um, Dr. Amian gave a terrific introduction. We have a very uh, wonderful website that includes a number of resources. One of the most important resources, perhaps, is the Our Experts tab of our website, where you can go and type in any topic and find out uh, U of M faculty members who are IHPI members who, who study that topic. So for example, if you were to type in aging, you would get a list of 28 uh, I, IHPI members which, who are U of M faculty members who study aging. Um, if you were to type in older adult, you get far more. So if there's a topic of interest, whether it's a health condition or a um, age group or a certain experience, you can type that into our website and uh, identify experts in, in the field who focus on that particular topic. And again, as I've noted, 
We use many of our members to help us kind of expand the work that we're doing with the poll. So we collaborate with a number of members on various topics. And I wanted to kind of end before going into a question and answer period um, to tell you a little bit about how to reach us. We are really eager to connect with you. Um, you may wonder how we decide on what topics we'll focus on. Um, we do that through a number of means. One of them is from hearing from people like you who identify topics of importance in, in your own life or uh, in your work. So we'd, we'd love to hear from you by email. Um, let us know if there's a topic that you think is really important for us to explore. Our email is healthyaging at umich.edu. Um, we've also, I wanted to make you aware that we have brought the five reports that Jeff focused on. Um, they're all, all the print versions are in the back at the table in the back. And we also have an email sign-up list where you can uh, provide us with your email address and we'll make sure you're uh, kept up to date on all the reports as they're released. So that would be approximately eight emails a year. Um, we also have the IHPI website on here, ihpi.umich.edu. Um, and we, we just, we welcome you for you to connect with us in, on social media and other ways so that we can continue to update you on the National Poll on Healthy Aging. Um, and I think from here I can open it up to questions. We've, we're very enthusiastic about this project and delighted to take any questions you may have. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll take that to number one to make sure it's recorded, number two to make sure that I understood it correctly. So the question was about um, doctors and prescription drugs, and about that the prescription drugs are so expensive and it's a big issue for a lot of patients. Why don't doctors up front already know that and already choose the cheapest one? Yes. It's a terrific question. Um, I think there's at least a couple kind of practical reasons. Um, you know, one of them is that um, certainly uh, when you're a provider and I'm a primary care physician at the VA, when patients have different kinds of insurance coverage, it can be hard, there can be different levels of cost sharing or co-pays for different, even the same medication for patients with just different insurance coverage. So what be, may be relatively cheap for one patient may not be so for somebody else. The other thing is that uh, we know also that there is uh, wide variation in the cost of prescription drugs within different communities, let alone across different health insurance plans, and even over time. So, um, you know, some of this I think has come to light recently in some of the media reports around why are prescription drug prices so high? It, it's a complex issue, and it's often hard when you've got a short visit with your doctor um, to, uh, you know, to think about what's going to be the cheapest option up front. And that's where we think that, uh, you know. Um, not only uh, highlighting for patients the benefits from talking with your doctor about your concerns about costs, but also perhaps talking with a pharmacist about that too, but also getting the message out to providers about how many patients are facing high prescription drug costs are really important. And hopefully that will lead, be a small part of the solution leading to just what you said, that you know, without having to go to a third medication or already having to experience high costs, then addressing that issue maybe more consistently that can be done up front. You know, I think that our report um, highlights the fact that many older adults maybe don't realize the complexity um, and you know, that the cost can vary for these drugs and um, operates under the assumption that their provider knows how much these drugs cost for them, which obviously is, is not the case given how much the provider would have to be able to understand about their insurance coverage, about uh, many other factors related to their access to that specific medication. So I think one of, one of the messages, of course, was that you know, um, perhaps don't assume that, you're, that your doctor necessarily knows how much the cost of that medication is to you um, and have that conversation with your provider. Potentially, it could lead to uh, lower cost options becoming available to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I just want, I want to tell a little story, but I was fired by my dermatologist, and I was fired because he said I didn't do what he said to do. And indeed, there were things that I didn't do, but I also had a memory problem. And I think that doctors, when they're giving you something, you need to have a piece of paper or something that tells you exactly what 
what to do like that because he got mad because I had a gun on the kid. Well, I think, well, piss on him because he should have told me. He said he told me. <laughs> he, he went out of the doctor, the office, and he said, I can't serve you anymore. You don't do what I do. When I tell you, so, yeah, so the, the, the question or comment was about um, an interaction with a provider who fired you from their practice because you weren't following recommendations. Uh, but you also had some limitations, you said, maybe in terms of your memory that made it difficult for you to remember what exactly you were supposed to be doing. Um, first of all, I'm sorry that happened. Uh, that sounds very frustrating. Um, you know, we've not specifically focused, I, I think this illustrates the challenges that many older patients face in being able to get the health care they need and also effectively communicate with their health care providers. You know, again, I, I, as a primary care physician, I hate to keep going back to that, but we see this again and again. We've got short visits, a lot to do. When you're older and have more mounting health problems, there's a lot of territory to cover. Things go fast. And then on top of that, when you have trouble remembering sometimes, which is really, really common, um, that that can lead to a lot of conflicts between what the doctor thinks is going on and what you think needs to happen, let alone whether or not you agree on what actually should be done. That's another issue. Um, I think, you know, we've not specifically done a poll on communication and maybe, uh, you know, written communication with providers or care plans or things like that. Um, you know, maybe that's an area that we should think about. So I appreciate you sharing your story with us. Um, and, you know, that maybe gives us some more food for thought about how we can see how common some of these issues might be across the United States and what can be done about it. Um, Erica, did you want to add to that? I would. Um, yeah, thank you very much for sharing your story. I'm really sorry to hear that it, sounds, it does sound very, very frustrating. I, I, I do think one of the values that the poll brings is to be able to share some of the experiences that people have related to getting the care they need, understanding what um, is expected of them, how, what they can do to improve their health and and what those barriers might be. And we didn't say very much about how we develop our poll questions, and maybe I should step back a little bit. In addition to the methods that Jeff described, we are the ones that develop the questions for this poll. Um, we do that, we have a team approach. We also um, collaborate with our ARP partners who review the questions as well. And one of the things that we try and do is, although these polls are very, very brief, we actually cover several topics, and typically it takes the average respondent fewer than 10 minutes to answer all of the questions, um, we try and offer response categories that would um, would cover the various experiences that people might have. Um, because we really want to recognize those. As much as we can't tell every story, or we can't necessarily know what exactly the reason was that someone had that experience, to be able to highlight that experience and um, kind of translate it to, we have about 2,000 respondents, and that would amount to potentially millions of people in this age group with that experience in the country. So we try and get as much information as we can to share to, to share that, although this, the story isn't always there. Um, and, but one of the ways we do that is we pre-test our questions. So we pre-test um, each uh, survey with 100 people. We get those uh, results back. We're able to kind of think about whether a question needs to be reworded or the response categories should be altered new categories added, for example, so that we can get at the experiences that people are having. We want to make sure that we're kind of on target with our questions and with the option that people have to respond, um, because we want, we want to get at you know, what is going on for people. A doctor may think you're not, you're not following through on their orders, but the reality is that it might be much more complex than that, whether it's memory issues or other challenges and being able to uh, go, you know, move forward with their recommendations. Sure, yeah, so the, the question was whether we're, whether the poll is being used to develop specific recommendations around health care policy. Um, I don't think I would say that we go quite that far. Our, um, I think our goal is to highlight issues that are really ripe for action around health care policy and really bring the older adult perspective into that conversation. Um, because we recognize that was something that was missing. We have all these important health policy topics, many of which affect older people. 
doesn't necessarily mean we're thinking about older people and their experiences when we um, develop that policy. So I think that's that's where I think we're, we feel like we're making a leading contribution. We're not trying to set the policy agenda, but we just hope that we can uh, kind of share share an important uh, stakeholder perspective that may help to inform it. In the midst of us talking about all these different drugs, in the midst of the senior populace, I watched my mother go from we were ready to plan her funeral to her deciding that she wasn't ready to go and she snapped around like there was nothing wrong with her, like because we were working with the RN that was coming in home and the physical therapist because she had had a mini stroke there because my point is she went from us ready to plan a funeral to Let's go to dinner. I got, I talked to the RN and I said, uh, all right, explain it. It's not in the books. All right. So my question to you would be, how often do you see like a spontaneous, like, you know, I ain't got time to die. I want to go to dinner. Uh, and, they're, and they're fine. I have no, no explanations in any of the books why. How often do you see a spontaneous, uh, I'm okay now? <laughs> we were just joking about whether Erica wanted to take it. I, um, I, so that's amazing. Um, you know, I, I will say, so sorry, uh, to repeat the, the question in the comment uh, was that you described your, your mother, who it sounds like was very, very ill, and you, in your words, and said you were planning her funeral. Yeah. Let's wait until she wakes up and see what happens. If you're ready to call cousins. Yeah, yeah. You know. but, but then she had a spontaneous turnaround. She, well, seriously, well. she said to my son, Michael, I'm tired. I'm ready to go be with Grandpa. And she had time to think about it. The next day, she saw and says, "Nah, I'm not ready to die yet. Grandpa's gonna have to And she was, "Come on, let's go to dinner." And I'm, yeah. I kid you not. Now, yeah. How often? They, they, the RN said he seems spontaneous. I'm okay now. How much and how more powerful are we than we give ourselves credit for? Yeah, so, so the, the question is how often do people maybe, um, in spite of all the technology and all that we know in medicine yes. in 2019, how often are our predictions wrong? I'll maybe generalize that question a little bit maybe more. Maybe not wrong, they just change it. Yeah, well, um, I will say that in general, even in 2019, with all of our technology, all the money that you know Senator Bison mentioned, how much we spend on healthcare, in spite of all of that, um, that there's a lot that we don't know still in medicine, and there's a lot that we can't predict. Um, you know, so, so I think that that is something that's common. Um, and I think that, you know, if I may pivot it back to the poll a little bit, there's also a lot that we don't know about what older adults' experiences are with their health, with their health care. And that's where we're trying to drill down to, you know, what are some of their health concerns and challenges their experiences so that we can identify opportunities for how, uh, you know, stakeholders, policymakers might address some of those problems. So a lot that we don't know in medicine, a lot we still don't know in public health and health policy, too, and we're hoping to contribute there. I would say to broaden it even more, you know, I think one of our other messages, of course, is that there's opportunities prevention for prevention at all ages. Um, it's, you know, perhaps never too late, I, you know, um, to kind of think about what um, what might someone might be able to do to improve their health and their well-being. Um, and so, although you know, I think we would hope that we could actually uh, include in our cult people who are older than 80, we are limited uh, because of the sample available. Uh, we want to make sure that we continue to have a nationally representative sample. Um, but we see that, you know, especially for 50 to 64, there's ample opportunity for prevention and even for 65 to 80. The more we know about people's experiences, the more we can think about how do we best tailor the messages to encourage uh, healthy behaviors and, and well-being throughout the life course. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, we'll, no, we'll get you next, I was saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, obviously, the role of healthcare providers, primary care providers, preventative health, also behavioral factors is critical, and a lot of your topics focus in on that. I represent um, an area agency on aging, and we're very focused on in home supports, what's available to help an older adult stay at home, have a, a um, healthy, active, engaged life. And we are hearing more and more about, some of us have been talking for a long time, social determinants of health. And those other, quote unquote, non-medical factors 
that will impact the health and wellness of anybody, but in particular older adults. Um, not familiar with all 60 years reports, you've highlighted several of them. Have there been or will there be any that will continue to focus on social determinants of health and also what the community-based services are and could be to support the health of older adults? Sure, I can take I can take that a little bit. Yes, we, we definitely recognize the importance of social determinants of health, and we in the poll have thought of health very broadly. So um, our latest report, which was on loneliness, is I think one example of that. Um, we recognize, of course, that many older people um, feel a sense of loneliness. We ask specifically about feeling a lack of companionship and feeling socially isolated. And as Jeff um, showed in, in the slide, 34 percent of people said that they lacked companionship and 27% said that they felt socially isolated. We recognize there's a multitude of factors there and that social services and engagement with the community could really help potentially address those points of loneliness which have strong connections to health. Uh, we actually identified in the poll that people, as Jeff said, people who um, identified as lacking companionship or feeling socially isolated were less likely to engage in healthy behavior so that there's kind of a a very strong connection there between between health and feelings of loneliness. Um, we, we do anticipate um, releasing other reports on social determinants and more kind of social factors related to health. And um, for example, you know, our, our next report related to pets, you know, we recognize the important role that pets may play in people's health, in health and well-being, not necessarily, um, uh, you know, it, it's broader, the role can be broader than, um, than one might recognize. Um, I, one other uh, report that I do want to mention, um, our report from the fall of 2017 focused specifically on dementia caregiving. And in that report, we focused on uh, the um, resources that are available and identified that many caregivers are not actively seeking out resources. Um, and there's probably a variety of reasons why that's the case, but it also allowed the opportunity through our uh, media, through our uh, press releases, for example, to highlight resources in the community that might be available for dementia caregivers. Um, recognizing that sometimes people don't know what they need and it's about kind of letting people know that Mary Agents on Aging and other organizations exist to provide those resources to people and that they're available when people need them. So the only other thing that I would add briefly to that would be that um, you know another factor in considering what topics we address in the poll, we again work in partnership with our colleagues at ARP. Um, they have their own research shop as well, and so you know if you're interested in these topics, it'd be worth going to their website and seeing what kind of research they do. Um, I think that adds a lot of value. We're always trying to see are there synergistic opportunities or ways for us to complement what they've done, so it's not a direct substitute. So yeah, I'm not sure if for that particular topic, if that's something that they've already addressed or not. Um, but I will say that you know part of us being here about one of the many values for us is hearing from you all about what some topics might be. So that's one we'll certainly take back. And I think, you know, certainly the in-home supports that people have that remain, that uh, allow them to remain independent in their homes is of critical importance in this population. I know that for my own parents as well, I think many of us probably share in that too. Um, so thank you for that. And um, certainly something we'll think about. Yeah, sir, yes. Now you opened up a lot of different topics. Um, one of the things that was interesting was the loneliness perceptions, but I'd like to piggyback really on the, the comment about uh, generic pharmaceuticals, drugs, the overuse of drugs, and um, but mostly, the, is there a perception out there about the relative quality, like compounding pharmacies not aside, but, but the relative quality of say generic for drugs or recommendations as opposed to ones that are name brand, where they're manufactured, uh, all the different variabilities there. And again, when you have all the drug interactions, I mean, my, my mother-in-law had 14 different prescription drugs she was taking before she passed away. And it was like, um, there were drugs that were counteracting the counteractions or you know, contraindications of the other drugs. And it was like, um, we have so many things that we do with, with prescription drugs that we really need to look at. And communication is, is one of the things that, that I think you really have hit on. But the loneliness and, and then just depression and, and other mental states. I mean, there are so many things that go into aging and that, that this population that, that again, you've, you've, got <laughs> you've got years and years and years of stuff that you can work with. But, but the question about, I guess really what I want to come back to is, perceptions about generic pharmaceuticals and the quality of that and the quality of drugs in general. And even if they're name brand, what is, I mean, what is the variability and quality of, of, 
of where they're manufactured and and how long they've been on the shelf and all sorts of other things like that. Um, well, yeah, can you comment yeah. on that? Yeah. Sure. So, so the question related to uh, so like consumers' perceptions of or patients' perceptions of the quality of prescription drugs and their issues well, around yeah. brand, generic versus brand name. There's issues around shelf life and things like that. You mentioned also interactions and then other social factors that may relate to people's adherence and things like that. I completely agree with you that um, you know the issue is really really complex around older adults' use of prescription drugs. And you know, one really important part for many Americans is the cost that they face when for those drugs. Uh, that sidesteps a lot of the issues though that you you mentioned. Um, let alone should people be on those medications. You know, again, in one of our modules, we looked at overuse of healthcare, healthcare that doesn't add value for people and could lead to unnecessary harms and costs. So there's a lot of different lenses through which to look at that problem. I do suspect that over the years, prescription drugs is one that because of all these layers that we could continue to come back to and look at different facets of that problem and, and again, hopefully contribute to some of the, the solutions in those areas because I agree that there's a lot of opportunities to make things better for older adults in that area. We actually um, we did do a report on drug interactions and um, one of the things we looked at is that many, um, many older people are getting their prescription drugs from a variety of pharmacies. Um, so their pharmacists that they see may not know the other drugs that they're taking and the potential for interaction, you know, they wouldn't necessarily recognize the potential for interactions. So there are pharmacies that may offer cheaper, you know, one drug at a cheaper price than another pharmacy. So someone may go there for one specific medication, may go somewhere else for the remainder of their medications, and the, you know, the indication that they might have interactions may not, may not be uh, evident to them or to the pharmacist that they're seeing there. So it's something we have explored, and it's, it's an important topic and what I imagine we, we, we will likely revisit some of these topics as Jeff mentioned sometimes we'll focus on just the 50 to 64 age group or just the 65 to 80 we you know we often consider the possibility of you know flipping it focusing for example on dental care among those 65 to 80 what does that look like um, or thinking about another angle for some of these same topics one of the things that we recognize is that the, the children's poll, that one of the things that they've done so successfully is to revisit topics over time. And they've been able to gauge uh, you know, changes in parents' perspectives of those topics uh, over the years. And we would have the potential to do the same uh, through the National Poll on Healthy Aging. Have you decided on your poll topics and are you so um, uh, the question was about how we develop the poll topics. Um, we are in the process of developing questions for our next fielding, which will be our fifth fielding. Um, so we are thinking kind of through the end of the year now what our topics will be for reports through the end of 2019. So we're usually thinking about, you know, about six to nine months ahead. Um, but we, we envision this being a project that will be ongoing, that we like to see the University of Michigan National Poll and Healthy Aging be something that's really sustainable and um, our support from ARP and support from IGI has, has really made that something that I think it's possible. Um, so we really are thinking down the line of topics that um, that you know are you know coming up as being important whether it's right for policy or it's because it's important for older adults. We listen to folks like you, um, uh, we've done listening sessions with older adults, we Engage our IHPI membership. Look at what research is being conducted among the faculty that we work with. Um, we we keep uh, closely abreast of the news. What topics are clearly um, you know raising you know, being um, uh, being made uh, uh, visible in, the, in through the news. Um, but we really again we welcome hearing from any of you. Please feel free to email us at uh, healthyaging@umich.edu if you have a topic that you think you'd like us to explore. We hear from a lot of people, so it may not be something we can do right away. There's also certain topics that are better for the poll than others. Sometimes if a topic is, for example, too narrow, we you know it, we, we want to make sure that our um, our sample size remains robust for the analyses that we do. So sometimes we, we want to make sure that the topic is broad enough that that the majority of our respondents can respond to that so that we can keep our sample sizes up. Order. 
where this passed, but it really was the patient's discretion and not actually one case of my the gerontologist said, no, that's too much of a burden on your mother for the back of the kid. But the PAs, you know, my mother thought it was like an order. So I think, you know, it's important for patients to realize that, you know, especially as they get older, they can decide the burden of the test or the treatment. I, you know, it's not Yeah, just briefly respond to that. So the comment or question was about um, people refusing medical care that had been recommended to them by a healthcare provider. Um, and I agree that that's, you know, certainly the, the patient is always, I tell people, you're always the decider at the end of the day, right? That's your decision. It's the healthcare system's job to provide recommendations to you and to be your agent. But at the end of the day, you're the patient, you decide. I think that, um, I can't recall if we had actually asked that in our overuse questions. But I will say that, you know, so that's a good example of something Erica just said. There may be a question that may be of interest to all of you or to others um, that may not be a great fit for the poll, but we're addressing it somewhere else. So, uh, for example, we have another study that we're going to be starting actually this summer where we did ask that of a nationally representative sample of older Americans. Um, we're actually going to be able to tie that to their actual healthcare utilization. So not just looking at what they tell us, but what kind of healthcare do they actually use recently. And so hopefully be able to see how common that kind of thing is. I've certainly seen that a lot myself. Um, but, uh, um, you know, again, a good thing maybe, you know, for, for other studies other than just the poll. So I think there may be a couple more, and I think we're coming right up to one, so maybe we'll take a couple more. Yeah. Well, I always say this all the time, and Annie will concur. Are LGBT people in any of your studies, and are they uh, defined as that as well? In That's a really good question. So the question was um, about um, uh, people who are LGBTQ in, and whether, number one, they're in our sample, and number two, um, are they identified as such? Um, so, you know, one thing that Ipsos does is in order to be a part of the panel, I believe you're a part of the panel, I think, for two years, um, and you have the opportunity to complete a whole lot of surveys over those two years. So they send out cards to people, so they, they sample people across the country, again, irrespective of computer or internet access. They use US mailing to identify people. Then when they say, yeah, I want to be a part of the panel, they indicate as such, and then if they don't have a computer or internet, then they provide that to them. Um, they ask them a slew of questions when they join the panel, and then I think annually thereafter. Um, I don't know off the top of my head if they ask about uh, uh, LGBTQ status, um, we have not produced any topics that focus on, uh, any reports that focus on uh, the unique needs of that population. Um, Erica, if you want to add to that? Yeah, you know, um, well, again, one of the things that we, um, have, uh, you know, one of our considerations is about sample sizes. And so one of the things that we have kind of tried not to do in, in some cases is to um, focus on specific subgroups only because our numbers get so small. But we know that those are very important groups to focus on. Um, I'm trying to remember, we may have had a question related to um, um, LGBTQ identity in our sexual health module, but again, I don't I don't think we, we usually don't necessarily go down that path, whether it relates to race, ethnicity, or a variety of demographic uh, factors, only because our numbers get a little bit smaller, and it's a little harder for us to say with certainty things that might be to that population. That being said, we may have the potential in the future to oversample for certain um, certain demographic groups, um, certain identities, so that we could have a whole module on a topic related related to that issue, for example. So, okay, <laughs> great. Yes, thanks. Uh, maybe one one final question before we wrap up. Um, well, as many of us know, seniors react very differently to some medications. I still encounter people where I know of certain drugs that in the 70s they said seniors shouldn't get. Physicians are still today, 30, 40 years later, still prescribing those drugs, seniors having reactions. Has anybody looked at the percent or, or the or just like how much of that is still going on with prescribers still not recognizing that seniors need either different dosing or different medications and that just kind of like, you know, 
Is that a problem? Is that happening a lot? Is it more isolated? But where prescriber, there's something lacking still in physician education, you know, prescribing education. So has anybody looked at that? So, so the question was about um, overuse of risky medications as people get older, um, things that can have side effects and are maybe not even indicated for that population. Uh, it's a really important topic, um, certainly for the, the health of older adults. Um, I think that's a good example of something that can be difficult to get at at the poll. Because in a short number of questions, trying to determine what would be an appropriate treatment for an individual could be challenging, in some cases could be impossible. Um, so we've not, you know, again, we had a module that focused on overuse of healthcare and you know, the times you got healthcare maybe you thought you didn't need and things along those lines and we were able to categorize that into types of healthcare services. But saying whether or not that was appropriate for that individual can be tricky in a poll. Now I will say, another good example of the connection to IHPI, so we have a number of our colleagues who do research, for example, on use of benzodiazepines or what we call sedative hypnotic drugs things like Ambien, so things like Xanax, Ativan, and other drugs that can have very serious side effects on older patients, and we really should question whether that's appropriate for older patients before we do so. Um, Overtreatment of diabetes, so uh, drugs that can lead to low levels of blood sugar um, when patients as they get older may not benefit as much as when they were younger. Um, you know, uh, we have colleagues across IHPI as well who are doing work in that area. So looking at healthcare that may be risky for older patients uh, looking at how often that happens and then what we might be able to do about it to make that less frequent. So I would encourage you to, I'm glad to, you know, correspond with you more about that if you're interested, I can connect uh, you to others also again through the IHPI website, um, identifying, you know, for particular areas you may be interested in, individuals in Michigan who may be able to uh, have, have research that could be of interest to you. And I think that we are right at time. <laughs> Stop forgetting the so uh, just really thank all of you for being here and thank you all for your engagement, for your questions, and uh, please let us know uh, how uh, we can be helpful to all of you in the future, and please again contact us, and, and we love to engage with people around the poll, so thank you again. And Dr. Jeff Copeland and Erica, Dr. L. Erica Solway. We want to personally thank you also from the Wolverine Caucus, from the Office of the Vice President for Government Relations, and the UM Alumni Association for this excellent presentation today. And we've certainly all learned a lot, and uh, certainly since all of us are getting younger, right? <laughs> but this is a very important topic, and I encourage you to get in touch with our presenters if you have any questions. We will make today's forum available online very soon, and it will also be available in public access TV um, venues around the state. And as I mentioned, there are materials on the back table we encourage you to take as you're leaving today. And again, we want to thank you, and on behalf of the Wolverine Caucus, may I please present both of you a gold Wolverine Caucus pen, <laughs> show of our esteem and our appreciation. talking about artificial intelligence. How many want to see cars that drive them and robots that run your home? Well, come out and learn what the University of Michigan is doing in artificial intelligence. It is a very new world. And that's again on April 16th. It will be at the Mackinac Room at the Anderson House Office Building. And then the next day on April 17th, we have the joy of the annual Michigan Alumni Reception in Lansing, and that will feature our President, Dr. Mark Schlissel, and Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist. So we hope that you'll join us for both of those, and in the meantime, happy spring and go blue!